All right, we're live. All right. Um, super excited to be here tonight uh, hosting this event with Halo in support of Baby Safety Month. We'll just give everybody a second to get logged in and then uh, Trisha and I will go ahead and introduce ourselves. Um, but thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, during Baby Safety Month. We're excited to talk about safe sleep tonight. All right. Thanks everybody for tuning in. I am Jen Saxton. I'm the founder and CEO of Tot Squad, um, which is a marketplace that connects new and expecting parents with all of the services they need from sleep consultants, lactation consultants, to car seat installers and baby proofers. Um, and we are so excited to be co-hosting this event with Halo in support of Baby Safety Month tonight. Um, it happens every September, organized through JPMA, which is the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. Um, and it's an organization that advocates for safe, quality um, baby and children's products. And uh, if you don't already know Halo, they are a trusted leader in safe sleep and the creators of the original wearable baby blanket, um, which I know has been loved and trusted by parents for over 20 years. Um, I actually used Halo sleep sacks with my daughter, Charlotte, is turning two tomorrow. Can't believe it. Time has flown so fast. Um, and I've got another baby on the way in the spring, and I am so excited to use the Halo Bath and Nest with her. I've got one right here behind me, um, which is just absolutely amazing. So um, before we dive in, don't forget that as part of this amazing partnership with Halo that we're giving away one of these Halo Bath and Nests. Um, the Lux version to one lucky winner, and you still have time to enter. Uh, we'll put a link in the comments, but it's totsquad.com slash halo. And uh, go on there. The giveaway closes at the end of this broadcast um, by 6 o'clock Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you go ahead and enter now at totsquad.com slash halo. Um, so with that, I would love to welcome my guest tonight, um, Trisha. And Trisha, I will let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background as a sleep consultant and as a mom. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Trisha Reed, a pediatric sleep consultant and a gentle certified, a gentle sleep coach certified uh, through Kim West program. Um, I am local in the Los Angeles area, but virtually, especially now in the COVID times, um, I'm working uh, nationally. So uh, I became interested in uh, sleep consulting uh, after the birth of my first daughter, who is five. I have a five-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. Um, when my daughter was, was born, I, like so many other mothers, became so desperate for sleep and so desperate for my daughter to have sleep and scoured the internet for answers, um, actually hired a sleep consultant at that time for myself. Um, I picked up a lot of stuff. Trisha, I think that we cut out while you were doing your introduction. Um, and I was just telling everybody that Trisha is uh, one of the best sleep consultants here in Los Angeles, and she's preferred by so many of the baby groups out here. So we're really lucky to have her expertise. So Trisha, why don't you quickly reintroduce yourself just in case people missed it? Uh, so the shortened version um, is uh, I am also a, a mother of two. I have a five-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of my knowledge comes from all of my studies, but it also comes from what I've done here at the house and what I'm still doing um, with my children in their sleep. And so there's, you know, there's a lot of sympathy go that goes out to the parents and the tired, tired moms and dads out there. Um, and and I, a lot of my work comes a lot, not just from that, but also, you know, I'm immersed in it with a two-year-old son. We're still doing a lot of nap transitions as well. So I'm super happy to be here and, and so excited to get started with this. Amazing. Okay, great. Um, so we will have some time for Q&A with Trisha at the end. So feel free to leave any questions in the comments throughout. And uh, we will try to get to your questions at the end. But um, we did have some folks who RSVP'd in advance. Um, again, at the link where you can sign up to win the Halo Bassinest, which is totsquad.com slash halo. Uh, so some of the questions that were submitted there, we'll start with those. Um, the first one was from Winnie, and she wanted to know, what is the best way to reduce my baby's risk of SIDS? Um, I heard that cellular blankets are okay for babies, but also that any loose items in the crib is a no-no. So what are my options for keeping baby warm and also having them sleep safely? 
Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, first and foremost, a wearable blanket is the greatest thing <laughs> to happen in that sleep world. Um, the sleep sack, the Halo sleep sack works really, really well here. They keep them nice and warm. They also keep baby um, hip healthy, which means their hips and their lower half are able to wiggle around. Um, the recognized Halo is actually the, the sleep sack is recognized by the International Hip Dysplasia Institute. So it's a really big deal to have that lower half loose um, and, and it keeps the baby nice and warm and there is nothing else in the crib. It is also, yes, as you mentioned, it's super important to not put anything else in the crib. Um, crib but, but, or, or bassinet, which is breastfeeding and pacifiers and room sharing, um, but, but put, placing the baby on their back to sleep is gonna be the first and foremost, most important thing you do. Great. Um, it looks like we're still having some technical difficulties, so apologies to anybody who had a slight interruption there. But um, Trisha, that was a great segue because the next question actually was about um, the idea that back is best and what that means for safe sleep. Um, one of our viewers, Kathleen, has a two-month-old who is already rolling onto her side and sometimes all the way to her tummy. So should a parent flip the baby back um, and risk waking the baby up? Or, or what do you do knowing the back is best? Because I know this can cause a lot of anxiety in the middle of the night. It can. It can cause a, a lot of anxiety. Um, and and honestly, the, the the research shows that the back sleep, the back sleep position carries the lowest risk of SIDS. But what we're asking you to do is to place the baby when they go down for sleep, whether it be day or night, on their back. Um, what they then do in the crib is sort of up to them. They're developing new skills if they move to their side and if they're strong enough to move to their belly, it's okay. We do not have to go in and flip them back over. Um, two months is re really young to yeah. be rolling. So uh, congrats to your little one. That's, that's a huge accomplishment at such a, a, a young age. And as they grow and they get older, they're going to be doing some really weird things in the crib because that is, or in the bassinet, they're, that is their time to, to shine. They're, they're working on their skills. They have their own space. Um, it's nice and quiet, no one's interfering. So you see a lot of weird things happen. You know, they'll then learn to pull to stand. A lot of babies then start falling asleep sitting up because they just learned to sit up. So we see it all. And to as, as much as we can, we try to, you know, stay out of that. If they're strong enough to roll to the belly, it is okay to keep them there. That's great. And bless your heart, Kathleen, because if your kids are rolling at two months, you're gonna be walking at eight months. <laughs> my Definitely. daughter walked, took her first steps at nine months old. And I'm like, I would give no. anything for like the next <laughs> nine months of my life back to have had a baby beginning to walk till she was 18 months old. But <laughs> really, for sure. Anyway. So, um, so what happens if my baby falls asleep while feeding? Um, what are the best ways to try and move the baby to a safe sleep location or position? Um, you know, a lot of this depends on the baby's age. Um, if you have a newborn, um, a very young baby, transferring, you know, your infant to their sleep, safe sleep location is usually fairly easy and they'll most likely stay asleep. Um, if they happen to fall asleep while breastfeeding, most likely they're usually going to be, their bellies fall, they've, they've done what they needed to do, they're most likely going to be able to just be transferred right away. Um, as they get a bit older, we want to be just a little bit careful because, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard of drowsy but awake. We want to be putting our, our, our children to sleep in their cribs or their bassinet, drowsy but awake after a certain stage. And what this is doing is it's just signaling, I the last thing I remember to the baby, the last thing I remember before I fell asleep was myself alone in my own surroundings. And I was able to put myself to sleep. Um, there's a lot of self-regulation that goes into that, a lot of self-soothing. And it's a really, really important skill and a really big skill to learn that you will have the rest of your life. Um, so as they get older, it's it's important to sort of once they you can sense that they're they're starting to to slowly suck, you want to unlatch and see if if you can get away with it's a little bit of a tricky position get away with transferring them while they're a little bit awake because you know if they are an older baby you want them to remember I woke up 
I ate, I can go back to sleep. Um, mm -hmm. Not the last thing I had was mom. And then I wake up again in 30 minutes because mom's not there. Um, but usually in the younger ages, it's pretty simple to just go ahead and, and transfer them. It's surprising, actually. You'd be very surprised. I mean, they'll sleep through vacuum cleaners and it, things at that age, right? So. I, the, the first time I, I, I did a dream feed with my second, and the first time I did it, I was amazed. I never understood how a baby could actually not really wake up, be taken out of the crib, be fed fully, and then put down without them ever realizing anything really happened. And it's, mm -hmm. it's done. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think it's, it's so important to make that transfer to a safe sleep position. Um, I remember being so terrified in those early days when I was so sleep deprived that I was going to fall asleep on the chair, on the couch, in the bed with the baby. Um, and I wanted to make sure that she had a safe sleep location. And so uh, it's just extra scary when you're really sleep deprived yourself and you don't want to fall asleep yeah. um, when the baby's not in a safe location. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, more about swaddling. Um, what are your recommendations and like favorite easy way to swaddle a newborn? Uh, I know back in the pre-COVID era, we could go to classes and practice swaddling live. Um, and I have some hilarious videos of my husband trying and failing at that. So, um, but yeah, what are your best tips for swaddling? Um, you know, as as the 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 newborn comes home, usually there are muslin blankets everywhere. This is like. Mm -hmm. They're everywhere and they're a really great lightweight item. Um, we used those quite a bit for both. As you said about your husband, my husband had the worst time learning this swaddle and watched video after video, the poor thing. And I would walk by and there would be an arm out or a leg out and it would just, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't the type burrito we hoped it would be. Right. Um, <laughs> So enter the Halo sleep sack. Someone had gifted us the, the Halo sleep sack and I broke that out and it was a lifesaver for, for, the, for the baby, but a lot for my husband. It became super, super easy. It has, like I said before, it has a roomy sack design so the baby can wiggle. Um, the, they have easy adjustable fasteners across. You can keep the baby nice and snug, an inverted zipper so that you're doing the night diaper changes, which you're, you're mm -hmm. doing quite a bit of, um, can happen in that low light and very, very simply and easily. Um, so for us, for both of my babies, the halo sleep sack was a, a game changer and it became, you know, the thing that I was gifted at my baby shower and the thing that is always then gifted at the next baby shower and given because parents love it. Yeah, I, we ended up switching to the sleep sack and abandoning the swaddles pretty yeah. quickly ourselves. Yep. And I found that I actually needed to have several on hand because um, before I discovered that overnight diapers were a thing, like you can actually buy special ones labeled for, for overnight, uh, my daughter kept peeing through her diapers and we would have to switch uh, sleep sack in the middle of the night. So um, definitely was a lifesaver for us. Yeah. Um, so another thing that I personally lived through was that my daughter got a bald spot on the back of her head from sleeping on her back. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I was like deeply embarrassed about this from like three to eight months old, but um, I believe it's fairly common. So uh, is it something to be concerned about if your baby gets a flat spot or a bald spot on the back of their head from sleeping on their back? Uh, the bald spot, no, that's, that's going to be, um, you know, babies have, you'll see, they, they start to lose their hair and then regrow hair. So, you know, with my daughter, we had a, a hairstyle we called business in the front, party in the back, because <laughs> it was very, you know, clean cut here, but in the back, it was bald. And just like you said, the hair down here. Oh uh, so that's just cosmetic. That's just a moment in time where you get to laugh at your lovable and adorable baby. Um, the flat spot can be, um, something that you should be concerned about. It not, not always. Um, it's called plagio, uh, plagiocephaly. And it is, it happens, obviously the, the baby's skull is still very soft. And so they're laying on the back as we're, we're laying them to sleep on their back. They're sleeping on their back for so long that it then creates that flat spot. What's also happening is during the day, a lot they're laying on their back. Um, so this is something that if you're concerned about it, definitely talk, uh, talk to your pediatrician about it. Um, you know, they're doing the head measurements every time we go for the checkups, but if you see something and don't have a checkup for a little bit, definitely reach out. Um, 
the best ages to get that checked out and to get treatment is, um, I believe before between four to six months. And so you kind of want to make sure you're in that window so that you're looking and checking. It's just the easiest time to get treatment. Um, and a way to combat that is tummy time. Mm -hmm. And tummy time is uh, not always loved by every baby in the beginning. Um, I have many, many moms who say, I can't do it. My baby cries the whole time, doesn't like it. Um, but they get used to it. And it's super important for this reason. Um, the more time that they spend on their tummy during the day. And as a newborn, you know, you're only going to be able to do three to five minute sessions a few times a day, but you know, that works up as they get older and they turn four or five months, they should be able to do about 20 to 30 minutes a day. Um, and it's a really great way to get them off of their back, uh, off of their back. So they're not having that, that flathead syndrome also. Mm -hmm. Well, and even if you get the flathead syndrome with your baby, like that's why you see so many babies these days wearing helmets since the back to sleep campaign came out. Yeah. And I've seen so many really cute designs and parents who decorate yeah. them. Um, and, and own it. So I think it's still the safest option um, is to put the baby to bed on the back. So let's talk about other um, sleep tools. Uh, I know a lot of families are deciding between a crib, a bassinet. Um, what are kind of your favorite products that are out there right now? And how can you find out if a product is JPMA certified and safe for sleep? Um, you know, because not all of them are. Right. Um, you know, as there's a reason why the, the Halo bassinet is the top of the market, it is, it really is the best out there. Um, you know, we, we didn't use it for my first. And then when I used it for my second, it was, it was a game changer. Um, you know, it's, it has, it is, as you said, uh, JPMA certified, um, and JPMA goes above and beyond the legal requirements. So being JPMA certified is huge and not, as you said, every um, product is, and it is hard to get certified. Um, so you can check, I believe they have like, you know, they have a little certification seal on their products um, that they are certified. So definitely look out for that. There are some lists online as well that, that show what products are certified. Yeah, um, JPMA.org. Yes, JPMA.org. You can go and check that out for sure. Um, but you know, with the Halo bassinet for for me and my family, both of both of my children had reflux, mm -hmm. um, and so the biggest thing for us was it was so easy to clean. And if you have a reflux baby who has a lot of vomit, um, you're cleaning a lot, a <laughs> lot. Uh, and so it was so nice to just be able to have a wipeable surface that we could get rid of that keep them back, back to sleep and, and keep moving forward. It's, a, it's just a really, really wonderful bassinet and it can stay, you know, right by the side of the bed while keeping them in their own separate safe uh, sleep space, which is important. Yeah. Absolutely. I, like I said, I didn't have one for my first baby either. And once I received this one, I could start setting it up and playing with it. What I'm so excited about is, is I'm probably gonna have to have a C-section this time. I did last time as well. Um, and it was so hard for me to get in and out of my bed. My bed's a little high and it was just like so painful for me after my C-section. So I would have to have my husband available to like walk over and get the baby and bring her to me. And so I just love that this will like literally give baby her own separate space, but allow her to still be right next to me in the bed. Um, so I think it's, it's really genius. Um, and, and then I was like learning about all the swivel features and things so that you can get in and out of the bed without having to move the whole thing. So Which is such um, a wonderful design. Yeah, really, really smart, um, innovative design. Uh, so we had another question that was submitted from Kaylee. Uh, she wanted to know at what age or weight should my baby stop using the swaddle? My baby is six weeks old and loves to sleep with her hands by her face, but then she startles herself, wakes herself up if her arms are completely out of the swaddle. Right. <laughs> we have uh, heard of this before. <laughs> uh, this is nothing new. The, the, the Halo sleep sack um, for her is, is actually the only, uh, I believe it's the only sleep sack that has an adjustable style where you can swaddle with the arms in and down. Um, and you can also do the hands to the face, which would really work well for her right now. And you can also, I then um, think after that, you can do it with the arms out. You can put one arm out to start, then both arms out. Um, and it really, I know it really becomes that process, you know, the, with the, the reflex or the reflex, 
um, the moral reflex that the baby has, that is that that sort of jump that that wakes them up constantly. Or if you're watching a newborn, they just have that. And and the the swaddle design for them to be swaddled in is is keeping that reflex at bay. And so they're not able to sort of jerk themselves asleep. So at that age, I would say for sure, it would be really difficult for her to be out of the swaddle um, completely or just completely arms out. Um, and that you can do the hands by the face option. Um, mm. my, my son was also a, a hand, like a fist sucker or near <laughs> right near his mouth. It just needed to be near his mouth. So we kept doing it with his arms down and he somehow would manage to get them up anyway. So, yeah, there was a little ninja. So they will do what works for them and they'll find it, but you have that option to, to use that swaddle for that specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about bedtime routines. Um, I know that this is a huge topic. Everybody wants to understand how to sleep train or how to help their um, baby get as much sleep as possible because it then means more sleep for mom and dad. So what are the benefits of bedtime routines? And um, Holly had asked, at what age do you switch to a set sleep schedule um, versus just kind of reacting to the baby? Um, you know, that first and foremost, I am like, the schedule queen. I self-proclaimed, I love a schedule. I love a routine. Um, what I don't necessarily love is a timed schedule. So when you're doing naps um, or night sleep, it rarely will be, my baby goes to bed at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. because there's so many different things that happen throughout that day. And there are so many different, um, you know, if they, you know, start a nap late, or if they take a short nap, really what we're looking at are those awake windows. So certain babies of certain ages, the younger, um, can only stand or handle a certain amount of awake time. And once, the, as they get older, that wake time grows and grows and grows. And so it's really difficult to say, my baby sleeps this nap at this time every day. Usually we're looking at a time, a wake time. So your baby at a three or four month might be able to only withstand about two hours of awake time. Um, and that grows, like I said. So as much, I love routines. Routines are a whole other thing that I love, love, love. They're baby's cues. Um, we're just giving babies these cues to let them know what comes next. This calms their system. They're able to know what to expect. They can sort of self-soothe as they're and self-regulate as they're moving throughout throughout the day, knowing what's coming next, especially with a bedtime routine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I remember hearing about bed bedtime routines and being so confused. And then I was like, oh wait, it's literally just something as easy as like we do a bath, we read a book. We put on our swaddle, we sing you twinkle, twinkle and put you to bed. And like, yeah. that was our bedtime routine. It wasn't some like 25 step long. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's, and that's, I think that's what sort of makes people shy away from the bedtime routine. It doesn't have to be a long drawn out routine. Um, the thing that is important is it should be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, if something happens and you're running late and you're getting the baby into bed, that's the things happen. Um, but we want to stay consistent. So we keep just showing them, this is what happens when you go to sleep. And now we, now they know what is expected of them next. This, this happened, this happened, this happened. I'm now expected to go to sleep. Yep. And so I know a lot of my friends were really into this book, like 12 hours by 12 weeks. And I was nursing my daughter several times in the night uh, until she was a year old. So I was like, there's no way my baby is just going to sleep 12 hours by 12 weeks old. Um, so what age do you typically recommend that parents start a bedtime routine? Is it a certain number of weeks or months? Um, a bedtime routine, uh, strictly a bedtime routine, just saying this is, these are, like you said, the things that we're doing before we go to sleep. I say we start at the earlier, the better. We're not talking about a sleep training and we're not expecting them to sleep for 12 hours. Um, but what you are doing is growing to that, right? They're getting older and older. And now as they grow, they know this happens, this happens, this happens. My five-year-old, we still do the same bedtime routine minus you know, the breastfeeding and the swaddling, yeah. but we still have the key things that we're doing. Um, and so I usually suggest around six to eight weeks, we start doing those little routines and they can be super small. Even if it's just, we do a bath, maybe you're not doing a bath every night, but we do 
PJs and then we do a feed and then we do a book and then we do a swaddle or whatever your, your routine may be. You can start that early when it comes to sleep training or working with a baby who you want to start uh, getting to sleep through the night or, or wondering if they can or if they are able to sleep through the night, you're looking at after five months. Um, yeah. And that's, that's just, you know, that's the safest time. And the best way to work with a baby is going to be after five months. Under that time, it's just really, really difficult. It makes a ton of sense. Um, well, we are just almost out of time. So I want to remind everybody one more time uh, that you can enter the giveaway to win the beautiful Halo Bassa Nest, um, the luxe version. Uh, and that giveaway is going to close in about 30 minutes. You can enter at totsquad.com slash halo. Um, and uh, we're really excited. We'll announce the winner ASAP. So um, thank you again to Halo, not only for being a category leader and an innovator with these amazing products like the Sleep Sacks and the Bassinet, um, but for taking safety really seriously and bringing experts like Trisha to the table to help share these really important tips. Um, we're really excited to have this platform to talk about safe sleep um, and celebrate baby safety month with all of you uh, and hopefully help all of the parents that are tuned in to sleep a little bit better tonight. Um, so thank you again, Trisha. Thank you, Halo. Everybody have a good night. Thank you.